you who are here. Got it. For those of you who are here from the bridge program that we also do, Rachel is our Marcus. So a few of you know what I mean. Um, okay, so thank you for having me and inviting me. I'm really honored. And um, thanks to you guys for coming. And I'm looking forward to reviewing what I said. So some of these 67ers heard this uh, before, like Marty, who, you know, basically put that whole thing together with others' help. Yes, many others' help. And we've heard some others, but, um, and so it's great that you're here. And so I, the thing that was hard about the last time uh, this happened or that I gave this little talk was that it would had to be condensed to 10 minutes. And right, Barbie? I mean, sorry, Barbara. Uh, and that was the hardest part. So um, they let me expand out a little bit and put back in some of the stuff that I had to cut. So I'm going to share my screen in a second, but first I'm going to turn off my video so that I can do that easily. And uh, then I'm going to do this. Oh, no, I'm not. Sorry. Where's, where's Marcus when I need him? Let's see. Okay, here we go. Okay, uh, can you guys see this all right? Yes, it's it's just starting the screen sharing. And then if you go up at the top, you it, should be able to uh, it, view it view it as a slideshow. Um, if you do, how's that? Um, if you go uh, to, oh, here we go. Oh, yeah, there you got go. Got it. Got yeah. it. Okay, is this all right? Yes. Oh, good. Angie's here. <laughs> I saw that. And Angie's here from Argentina. And David, her husband. Angie was my roommate at college oh, so many years ago. Okay. So hi, Angie and David. Um, so <laughs> when I was given the topic of social justice, I thought, oh, my word how do you tackle this one? And I decided, because it's a huge and such an important topic. So I decided that I would kind of just tell my story on what got me started in all this and what keeps me engaged in all this. And it's actually a pretty simple answer. Um, if, it, if it would go there, let's see. Wait a second, TechFuzz. My doc is in the way. Ugh. Uh oh, sorry. Wait a minute. Tech fuzz. It's okay. Usually, you can just use the arrow on your computer. I know, but my doc's in the way. Oh, it says the simple answer right now. Okay. Oh yeah, here it is. I found it. Um, it's those people that I met. It's those stories I heard and the things that I saw. And that's what kept me, got me going in social justice and what's kept me involved in it. When I was a kid, the people I met started it all out. And um, using Barack Obama's words, I was a somewhat improbable candidate to become an anti-racism activist. I was a white, solidly middle-class gal from suburban Milwaukee, in fact, a suburb called Whitefish Bay, which sometimes is known as White Folks Bay. The only people of color I saw at home were the cleaning women going to work on my block. My awareness of skin color started on my grandparents' farm in the mountains of rural Virginia um, in Bath County. It was the South. I spent all my summers there. I loved it. Any tiny bit of mental health I have, I attribute to that farm. And um, a colored woman, as we at the time said, named Fanny 
worked for us on the farm. We all loved and adored Fanny. She opened up the house before we got there from up north. She cooked the best food in the world. Oh my God, <laughs> those buttermilk biscuits. She prayed us in with her Bible down at the river when we got lost on horseback. And she was fastidiously neat and clean. When I was about five, Nana, my grandmother, took us kids to visit the Natural Bridge, which is a, was a nearby tourist attraction. I was learning to read and I sounded out the word colored on a bathroom. I asked Nana what that meant. She said, that dear is the bathroom Fanny would have to use. I peeked in and clearly, I clearly remember it was disgusting and it smelled really bad with flypaper, nasty flypaper hanging from the ceiling. I said, why would she have to use that? And Nana said, well, that's how it is here in Virginia. It's not fair and it's not right. And I was horrified to think Fanny would have to go anywhere near that room. Back on the farm, I saw chain gangs of colored men working on the road in front of the farmhouse. They were chained together in the hot sun, hot tar, all day long. The idea of skin color started to filter in. Meanwhile, back in Milwaukee, where I lived most of the year, I was a huge Milwaukee Braves fan. Billy Bruton was my favorite player. Number 38, center fielder, really fast runner, awesome guy. He hurt his knee one time and was in the hospital and I was so worried, so I wrote him a fan letter. And um, he answered me, and that is one of my prized possessions. I had no idea he was also an activist for civil rights. Uh, he couldn't find housing in Milwaukee. And he was so tired of it. He was tired of being only a famous ball player. He also wanted to be treated like a free Black man. As I continued growing up, my awareness about patterns of prejudice and inequality also grew. It was dawning on me that skin color was a big deal in the U.S., South and North. In high school, Whitefish Bay High School, I read books, lots of books, like Black Like Me, The Autobiography of Malcolm X, The Other America. This is so bizarre. It doesn't want to go. Oh, well, let's let Beverly in. Um, so then I went to college. And um, once again, it was the people I met and loved that kept me engaged in this feeling that things weren't fair and they weren't right. In college, I got the idea that politics could be a place to help create more fairness. In the summer of my freshman year from college, I went back to Milwaukee and volunteered for the Tom Tuttle for Congress campaign. His slogan was 100,000 doorbells. I'm sure I rang 50,000 of them in the our all white district. I often encountered a door slammed right in my face. Tom Tuttle lost. I was sorely disillusioned because he was the better guy. And I decided to major in government at Wells. And I had Mr. Trelease for a history teacher. What a treat. There he is. You all call him Dr. Trelease, but I swear we called him Mr. Trelease. On spring break of our sophomore year, Mr. Trelease drove four of us Wells women to Raleigh, North Carolina um, to participate in a voter registration drive with students from Shaw University, a historically back, black college. That week changed my life. 
I took copious notes. And there they what? are. They're on yellow paper. Um, and a minute. Can, can somebody mute well, themselves? I decided I need whoever, to be there. Whoever isn't five, muted. Closer to 5.30. Rachel, could you mute people except for me? Thank you. Because it starts at Okay, so anyway, um, I took these notes, so I remember, but I remember anyway. My partner was named Vernon. He was from Shaw University, and he and I together knocked on hundreds of doors in poor Black neighborhoods in Raleigh. For a Black guy and a white girl to knock on your door was unheard of then and often met initially with suspicion. When we explained we were registering voters, though, people usually pivoted and welcomed us in with open arms, offering lemonade or iced tea or whatever they had. My heart was warm. It was kind of different from those Tom Tuttle doorbells in my home district. I reread my notes and the last sentence reads like this, quote, at the end of the week, the Shaw students took us to the bus station at 3 a.m. When Vernon hugged me goodbye, he said, this was the week that was. We were all in tears that it was over and my value system and life purpose were firmly taking shape. I had learned about Rosa Parks and Malcolm X and Martin Luther King, and had joined students who tried to date down a, quote, no colored allowed sign from a hotel, but it was too high and we couldn't reach it. That summer, after, by the way, finding, seeing a flyer on a bulletin board in the government and history office at Wells, I answered it, it was called Encampment for Citizenship, I went on a program at the University of Maryland and we registered voters in black neighborhoods in Washington, DC. I came back to Wells senior year and chose my senior thesis topic, home rule in Washington, DC, a topic sadly still unresolved today. This is not letting me click through it. Sorry, guys. Um, now you're seeing everything, right? Yes. Um, and the arrow. Okay, I got, okay. I got it. I got it. Okay. I got it. You got okay, it. this is my senior thesis. You're looking at it. And you can only read what it says. I know. How amazing is that? The only reason you can read it is because I wrote to the um, librarian named Tiffany Raymond. And I said, I don't have my thesis, but I remember the topic. And could you send it to me? And she tried really hard. She faxed it or whatever she did and scanned it. And it was so faint from that aged typewriter that I couldn't read it. So this year when I got invited to do this thing, I wrote her again. I said, Tiffany, or actually I talked to Randy and and he urged me to continue this uh, trial to get this. And I wrote to Tiffany again and she sent it to me. So um, there it is on digitized and I'm thrilled. She worked magic and I've read it, all 65 pages of it. What I can remember from being a senior in 1967 was this. Despite the fact, and I'm just saying this to prove a point, that I was kind of a kind of a straight A student or almost, there was on this um, thesis, B minus. That's what I got. 
And I worked harder on this thesis than I did on my PhD dissertation. I just want to say I did. I went to DC and, and sat for hours in the Library of Congress on microfiche and stuff. And um, it also said, this is nothing but a biased diatribe. And <laughs> I had been in Washington, D.C. the summer before, knocking on many doors. The people there deserved and wanted to govern themselves. And I had, after lots of research done, arrived at the conclusion, corroborated by many that uh, were not biased diatribers, that um, there should be home rule in Washington, D.C. My conclusion was that the reason D.C. was not allowed home rule was that there were just too many African-Americans who lived there. I still think I was right. And in fact, the topic of D.C. statehood and home rule persists today. I kind of have a feeling that Mr. Trelease and my department chair could have been a bit at odds about this grade and on my thesis, but who knows? Maybe they never talked about it. But at graduation, I received some sort of a government history prize. And I, I took that as a peace offering from the Department of Government at Wells College. I, that was just my interpretation. So when I knew I was going to do this, um, I heard something on probably Rachel Maddow about DC statehood and she named an organization. And so I called them or I wrote them and told them about my old thesis. And I talked with a guy named Josh Birch who runs Neighbors United for DC statehood. And he, it was really interesting um, talking to him. It's still a very hot topic debated last week in the Congress by Eleanor Holmes Norton and Jamie Raskin. Um, Josh Birch told me he would, or at least I felt he was interestingly optimistic, saying DC is closer to being a state than ever before. That for 40 years they've had their own mayor and city council, but it's still very, very dicey about achieving it for many political reasons. It's terrific that activists on the ground are working on it and that some political leaders are espousing it. After college, um, I joined VISTA, the Domestic Peace Corps, and became a VISTA volunteer in the South Bronx and East Harlem. In VISTA training, I lived with the Garcia family in the South Bronx, a mom and her six kids under the age of nine. The dad had been murdered a year before. Um, and the nine-year-old, Irma, gave me her bed to sleep in. There were ratones, rats, under it the first night I heard them. And I thought, well, if I can, if Irma can do this for nine years, I can do one night. And I spent a wonderful six years, six, six months. No six weeks there, knocking on many, many doors. And I was placed in East Harlem um, in, in later. And so I left the Garcias, moved to East Harlem, knocked on more doors for tenants' rights, welfare rights, and housing rights. I remember the, the Torres family, a Puerto Rican family in the dead of winter, the landlord provided no heat, no hot water. The ice was literally an inch thick on, on the window inside. They were using this, the stove, I know, using the stove for heat. Antonio, the six-year-old was sick, and of course he was sick. I was learning about all this stuff, how the courts worked sometimes and not other times, for some people and not for others. I experienced community and sticking together and resilience and grit. 
I experienced being the only white person on the block. My three best friends there, well, my two best friends were Stormy and Lily, Stormy Bond, an African-American woman, and Lily Morales, a Puerto Rican woman. Woman, We would have dinners together and bring food, and each of us was supposed to bring something that represented our communities. And we had great fried chicken and rice and beans, and I wasn't sure what to bring. Uh, meatloaf, uh, you know, or canned frozen peas. I, I didn't know. Anyway, um, throughout all that, I kept on seeing the same patterns. It wasn't that poor people weren't smart or that they were lazy or that they didn't try. Something bigger than individual circumstance was going on. Things were set up that way. It was systemic. It made me really upset, along with, of course, many others in my generation. So when I left college, I was determined to keep working in this arena one way or another. I just had to figure out how. So it was the 60s. I started protesting along with multitudes of others. I made lifelong friends. We protested racism, the war in Vietnam, four tenants' white rights and women's rights. And I'm deliberately skipping a chapter or two here that produced three arrests, five misdemeanors for protests and a month in jail in Pittsburgh. And after that, I ended up living in San Francisco in 1970. I drove my VW across the Bay Bridge from Oakland. I saw San Francisco and I thought to myself, that's where I'm gonna meet my husband, go to grad school, have my career, kids and my career. I was right, I did all that and I've never left and I won't. I became a psychotherapist in private practice for 30 years, 30 plus, loved every minute of it, but always, always I remembered the lessons from Fanny and Mr. Trelease and the Garcias and the Torreses families. So one day in the spring of 2001, when I um, was homesick with bronchitis, I Googled anti-racism. And I learned about the upcoming World Conference Against Racism in Durban, South Africa. I wangled my way onto a delegation to go to the NGO alternative conference to the UN one. Uh, and I wangled it by my, my acceptance by promising to do some version of activism after the trip. That was music to my ears as I had received an unexpected inheritance from my grandmother and was getting ready to retire from my day job. I wanted to be a good steward of her legacy and do some anti-racism work. So we went to Durban. Uh, in 2001, this was the conference this um, T-shirt was the swag I still have that we got. Um, it was quite a trip. Our delegation included women, human rights workers, and anti-racism activists. We were inspired by activists from all over the world. We visited Robben Island, where Nelson Mandela served uh, during um, during for 27 years of apartheid. I don't know why it's not letting me share. Sorry. There we go. And that was uh, Mandela's cell. It's now a museum where tours are connect conducted by ex-political prisoners. The guide we had explained that in the current time, some children of the former guards and former prisoners live on the island together in community. In that way, it's a symbol of the triumph of the human spirit over the adversity, suffering, and injustice of apartheid, all of which were an unfathomable price to pay. 
And then really 2002 until now, it's been a period for me of donor activism. Soon after that trip to Durban or South Africa, the Women's Foundation notified me a group was forming to work on lessons learned in Durban. I jumped at the chance. We formed RGHR, the Race, Gender and Human Rights Fund. From our less, not a very catchy title, but RGHR has stuck and we still exist. From our lessons in Durban, we chose to support marginalized groups who fell under the radar and were being harmed at the intersection of racism, sexism, and human rights violations. We picked our issue, the disproportionate mass incarceration of people of color in the US and our particular niche, women and girls in California. We of course read Michelle Alexander's book, The New Jim Crow, that traces the continuous thread from slavery in the US to Jim Crow, to the current mass incarceration of people of color. Mass incarceration needs to be abolished, just like slavery was. Amazingly, our GHR still exists and we've granted over $6 million to help incubate some 25 new organizations. We visited the um, Prison University Project, now called Mount Tamalpais College at San Quentin. And we sat in on an English class for the men. They were sharing their very personal writings. I swear, not a dry eye in the room. That project, as of two years ago, became the only fully accredited college in the US operating inside a prison. Now it's Mount Tam Mapias College. There are no such college programs for women in the state of California. How can that be? California has the largest women's prison population in the whole world, a dubious distinction. This is insane. We've started an exploratory group to tackle this. We visited prisons in California. This was a get on the bus one where caretakers and kids went to visit their moms in prison uh, and on Mother's Day. Some of the kids and moms hadn't seen each other for years because the prisons deliberately are far from home. Special preparations by the get on the bus organization were made for the heartbreaking good goodbyes at the end of the visit. The moms had each written a letter to their kid to be opened and read when and only when back on the bus after they had said goodbye. It's excruciating to think about those goodbyes. We met we got to know a lot of uh, formerly incarcerated people and some who, upon release, established programs to help other women coming out of prison. It's tough to be turned out in the middle of rural California, often at night, with a paper bag with $50 in it. What are you supposed to do? No home to go to, no skills. Easier to just return to that old drug-infested hood and probably cycle right back to prison. Susan Burton here and on the left and Kim Carter on the right, both started programs basically with zero dollars, but infinite grit and infinite heart. And against all our odds, with the help of other formerly incarcerated people, activists and donors, their programs grew from struggling startups into nationally recognized programs. Both Susan and Kim became CNN heroes. How cool is that? Um, and Kim says, our GHR invested in us when nobody else did. You guys believed in us. And I say, or we say back to Kim, what a privilege to have been able to do so. So my new retirement chapter was a lot of work and paying big dividends in satisfaction. I've learned so much. And so it continues. Another person I've met and more stories 
always that we've heard is Brian Stevenson um, and his Equal Justice Initiative in Montgomery, Alabama. He's been called the Nelson Mandela of North America and with good reason. Recently, while I was playing in a bridge tournament in Atlanta, I took a few days off to visit EJI's uh, Slavery Museum and National Memorial for Peace and Justice, which is about lynching. If I were a history teacher, I for sure would find a way to take my students there. It's a brilliant memorial to the 46 hundred plus unnamed, too often unnamed and forgotten victims of lynching. The coffin shaped steel slabs are outside hanging from above as if from trees. When it rains, the steel rusts and the water runs red. And it's amazing when you enter the uh, memorial, you, the those slabs are at street level or touching the floor. But as you walk around in it and it's all outdoors, the, the floor slopes down so that by the time you get to the end, you have to look up to see them, the slabs. Of course, I looked for the uh, victims of lynching are allocated in this memorial by states and by counties. So I looked up Bath County, Virginia, where my farm had been, my grandmother's farm had been and found it. And Anthony Abner was listed there as having been lynched February 27th, 1893. And so, in conclusion, we absolutely stand on the shoulders of those who came before. This improbable white girl's story stands squarely on those shoulders. Regular folks like Fanny, the Garcias, and Torres families, as well as iconic activists. And we are ever so grateful for those who carry on this fight, for this honor of standing on these shoulders, I have infinite gratitude for those who came before and for those who are continuing, keeping constant vigilance toward bending the arc of the moral universe toward freedom. These pictures are very current and this was today, two hours ago, or three maybe now, when the uh, in Tennessee, where uh, Justin Pearson was reinstated, and yesterday or the day before, day before, Justin Jones was reinstated. So the U.S. is a republic if we can keep it. That's the end, and that's my picture from uh, senior year, our senior yearbook. So thank you guys for listening. Let me see if I can get out of this. And oh, hi, I see people. Hi, Beverly. There's my video back. Oh, thank you. I didn't hear your clapping because it's muted, but that's okay. I saw it. That's what matters. Well, then we can unmute.